Hi there, class. Comparative religions, lecture one. All right. I want to start off with a story. We're here in comparative religions. Normally in class, I'd be asking everybody, hey, has anybody got a $100 bill? Anybody got a $100 bill? And uh, if some fool says yes, then I would take that $100 bill. No. I'm looking for a dollar. This in my hands is a dollar. Now, I want to share this real quick. And as we understand comparative religions, this dollar, um, how do I know it's counterfeit? How do I know it's real? And uh, in the Federal Reserve Bank, my mom used to work for the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas, Texas, where I'm from. And uh, she didn't work in the fraud department, but years later, I learned how they could find out if it's fraud. And, and I guess I want to ask you this is, um, how do we know this is real? Well, the first thing is there's a couple things. There's, I'm sure there's a watermark. You look in the light, it should be, there's a watermark. There's some kind of little line here, some magnetic strip. You can probably feel it. You can smell it like it's a dollar bill. You know that the ink or something. So there's several ways with the eye test. And then you even have some of these pens nowadays where you can kind of just mark on it and it turns color. There's some UV lighting that says it's real. Well, a Federal Reserve Bank, uh, they actually train their people to do certain things to know it's a dollar. And it's always with a blind test. So bottom line is this. There's so many counterfeit dollars out there, millions all sorts every day and and the point is they don't need to study the counterfeit dollar what they train them to do is to blindfold them and they should be able to do it with their eyes closed with a feel with a smell or the smell a scent to know if it's a counterfeit dollar and that's how they test if it's real or not and I think that's what I want you to do is as we study comparative religions it's nice to know, it's good to know, but I never want to load you up with, with, with ammunition to go and chop down other people. We, we're going to respect them, uh, those who have other faiths. And, and I love Cal Baptist. You don't have to be a, a Christian to be here, but you, you definitely want to respect people. Now, people do sign up for Cal Baptist, understanding that they must understand that we hold dear uh, to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But I want you to know that I want to be able to help teach you the real dollar and then be able to line it up with all the other faiths and compare it in that, se uh, in that sense as the benchmark, the dollar. Uh, other places, if you took comparative religions or religious study courses at, at, at you know, the community colleges, junior colleges, they, it's all equal. Yeah, we're going to learn A, B, C, D. But here at Cal Baptist, the way I'm going to approach it is we're going to learn A, which I believe is the truth, the Christian faith, and then we're going to compare those other faiths like the counterfeit dollars to the real dollar and uh, my hope is that we can go through that journey together so I'm going to pull up a document that uh, that's going to be helpful inside your blackboard I'll pull it up here is this document uh, in my lecture one is this document called a uh, uh, scorecard major religion scorecard so feel free to download that and uh, I want to uh, take a look at it. Let me go ahead and pull up my file here and see if I have it on my blackboard. Yes. Okay. I'm going to open this up, expand it so you guys can see it. Uh, okay. Now, what I'm going to do is in the following lectures, at lecture two, I want to talk about the, the Christian faith. And what we're going to use is it's, it's a rubric, a scorecard. There are eight major things we want to be able to at least compare. We have to have something to compare it to. And these are the eight things or eight qualities. Eight, uh, I mean, how do you know if it's a pizza, right? A pizza has to have at least cheese, uh, pepperoni, or no, it doesn't have to be pepperoni, bread, it has to be baked, something of that nature, a sauce, right? A pizza, what makes a pizza a pizza, right? Well, for the faiths that we're going to learn is Christianity, Catholic, Judaism, uh, Islam, Hindu, Mormon, and Jehovah's Witness, there are eight qualities or eight things that you want to check. And so I want you to print this out. Uh, I can't print it out for you, but I left it for you in your notes. But you're going to print this out, and what we're going to do is we're going to check them off as we go through the weeks together. And so you're going to find out that some are very similar to each other, but you're going to check the box yes or no, or sometimes maybe. You know, it's left to discussion. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that. So I'll always reference the scorecard. So please uh, have your scorecard ready. Um, but going back to my PowerPoint, 
I want you to understand that we have, uh, where do we start when we study comparative religions? Well, we have a Christian worldview. That's what I was just talking about. There is this real dollar in a sense, and we want to study that as best we can. We're going to find eight distinctives that all evangelical Christians uh, believe in. When I say evangelical, that's kind of like what I mean mainstream, the, the regular, the where everybody kind of aligns to. There are some that are gray areas in, in what we believe, but I want to focus on the Christian worldview of the eight major things. So uh, we definitely believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all right, the gospel. Now we might differ on baptism. Some do baby baptism, some do sprinkle baptism, some do immersion baptism, um, but that is what we call it gray area. We agree to baptism, um, but the mode or the how we do it may differ, and that's okay. Now I want to talk about tolerance and intolerance. Uh, there's a quote that uh, I'm going to read to you, and uh, and let me kind of shift it down if I can see it in class. Oh, you can see it right here. And uh, a pastor, a very famous pastor that I'm familiar with, uh, he said this, Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. That's Pastor Rick Warren. He was sharing that uh, on a, an interview uh, on a, uh, either 60 Seconds or, or, or one of those shows, CNN. Now, let me, let me help you break this down. In the world, we, we tend to believe that if I disagree with you, if I believe that homosexuality is wrong, that means I can't love you. Is that true? It's a better case. I disagree with my wife every day. In fact, I disagree with my son quite a bit too. He thinks that he should not eat vegetables, and I think he should eat vegetables. Do I love him? Do I love her? Absolutely. So if I disagree with my friend on his views on same-sex marriage, does that mean I am intolerant? Or am I tolerant? Does that, does that make sense? So the act, I'm actually intolerant of behavior, but I, I, I don't tolerate it because that's not something I want my son to be exposed to. I don't believe it is right because the Bible says so. But I also want to know that I do love my homosexual uh, friend. I do care, and I care a lot about him. But I think it gets sticky. It's like, wait, if you don't value what I believe in, therefore you don't love me. And I think... There's something wrong with that picture. And so, uh, again, I'm going to read that quote. Our culture has accepted two huge lies, too. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. No, I don't fear homosexuality. I don't hate that person. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Uh, yeah, I love my wife. I don't agree with everything she does. No, uh, I don't. I disagree quite a bit. I get in trouble for it, but I disagree sometimes. And both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. I hope that stirs on something with you. And with that conversation, you want to talk further about it. Please do. But we are to be toler uh, tolerant of people and respect where they come from. Respect their ideology. Respect their worldview. Respect doesn't mean I agree. Respect means, okay, I get it. That's how, how you did it. But, but I also want you to know that I am convicted with the Christian worldview. I see things through the lens of a Christian. It does not mean I'm dumb. It does not mean I'm, I'm uh, uh, unobjective. It means that I have come to a conclusion where after I've studied enough, I see this is more truth. Uh, there are always like discrepancies in everything, but I see the least amount of discrepancies in the faith that I uh, believe in. Uh, that I am convicted in, that I hold as truth. And so that's one. And uh, what is the gospel? So when uh, where we start, we need it. First, understand the gospel. So I'm going to ask you to pause. I'm going to ask you to go to this video link. What is the gospel? So if I were to click on that, go on the hyperlink, uh, I want you to know it should look like this. It's a video about four minutes long, and, and it's a pretty good summary of the gospel and so let me go ahead and ask you to pause and i'm going to come back watch the video should it go video yeah pretty fast well hey let me help summarize it the gospel is not that complicated it cannot be complicated and i don't want it to be complicated 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip down all the Christian lingo, and I want to just bring it down to the necessities, the nuts and bolts, the ingredients. Like there are many types of cookies. There's many types of cupcake sprinkles. I don't know why people like that, but at the end of the day, a cookie requires flour, requires eggs. Uh, I don't know what else. Get uh, guys, ladies, uh, flour, milk. No, that's what you eat them with. Flour, chocolate chip, milk. No eggs. That's it. Flour, eggs, sugar. Right? Four basic ingredients: flour, sugar, eggs, and milk. I don't know why I keep saying milk. Well, whatever. You get my point. Well, let me strip it down for you. First things first. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, in the Bible, it's very clear what is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me go ahead and open the Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15. And I have it right here. I use Bible Gateway. And we pretty much want to um, at least see what the Bible has to say. And, and, and part of this class, I just help me out here. I'm just going to pick the NIV version. Um, assume the Bible's true. I mean, I can get here and say, oh, I don't believe the Bible. Well, at least assume it. Assume it's true. So that if for, for the sake of this class, it's going to help. And so... When I say I'm going to the Bible, I'm using it as a reference to source, and actually that's going to be a big thing as we study the other faiths. What is the source of authority? And we believe this is the source of authority, but let me read this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, the gospel, the good news, which you received and on which you have taken your stand, conviction. By this gospel you are saved. You hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, his name was Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of other brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me, that's Paul talking, as to one abnormally born, meaning... Um, spiritually born. So let me go back to you in this. That is uh, 1 Corinthians, but let me just help you out here. And I, I'm going to share you uh, a blog that I wrote recently, What is the Gospel? And, and when you click on it, it should pop you here to my blog. And I, I summed it up very, very, very fast. Uh, and Acts chapter 2 is when the, the church was born. And uh, if you click on my blog, you click there, you can go straight to it. And, and what you will find out is that in these few verses, Jesus uh, has ascended to heaven, and Paul, Peter preaches the first sermon ever by the church. I mean, if, what are you going to do at the first sermon ever at the church? Well, he preaches the gospel, the clear good news, and he strips it down because it has to be so simple. It was like a five-minute sermon. So if you read it, that's it. It was that quick. Four parts to the gospel. Number one, incarnation. If you're taking notes with me, this is what it is. The incarnation of Jesus Christ in Acts 2.22. It says, Jesus became man. God was authenticated. You see, incarnation, which will rival every other religion. You're going to have to understand this because Buddhism believes in reincarnation and same as Hindu. And so there's all these other stuff. But incarnation means Jesus became man. God became man. The divine. And so very, very crucial because this is where it's going to steer in other faiths. Number two, uh, crucifixion, that God in man form was crucified. He died. He physically died. The cool part is that in, in verse 24 and 30, 32, is that Jesus Christ rose through resurrection. You see, resurrection is different than revivification. Revivification means it's kind of like a walking dead. Anybody watch that? It means uh, you die and then you kind of come back and, 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 and then you can die again. Resurrection means Jesus Christ came back alive and he never died again. And so uh, uh, King David worshipped this God who has been resurrected. He looked for it. And so when, uh, back then uh, in the verses when you read it, you'll see it. And ascension. See, we believe in incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and Jesus Christ ascended, raised into the sky. Jesus Christ is as he ascended as King and Lord, and he will come back. And so these are crucial elements. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it requires a response. It requires a response from you and from me. And we call that repentance. Repentance means change of mind. That our mind must be changed. That wow. 
something extraordinary happened. I, I might not be able to explain it, but in these four words, it requires my response. And so the gospel is not only just information, but it is something that you need to respond to. Everybody here watching and listening needs to respond to. And so I'm asking you, as you guys think about this, as we go through the journey together, that you will be able to respond to the good news. And that is what it requires. So the good news does require us, or like the Paul says in the Bible, or we believe in vain. All right? So I just shared that with you. And so uh, uh, just what is salvation? The salvation is a change of our mind, a repentance as we turn away from the old way of life and we turn to a new way of life, meaning this good news has changed the way we think and the way we live. And uh, these are some scriptures that you do. And that's what salvation is. Salvation is being saved or knowing that our lives was so messed up before that Jesus rescued us and, um, and brought us new life. So let me give you a picture here that I think is a lie. And I'm going to just write it here. We tend to think in life, um, and many, I talk to college students all the time, is that in life we have this line, this, this neutral line, this neutral space, okay? Neutral. Okay? This, I've never done this before, so I'm just kind of typing out neutral. And up here, we call that the, the positive space, or we can even say heaven, good life, right? And if I choose God, I, I go to heaven. And then down here, we call it the negative space, or we call hell, right? And if I don't make a decision, then leave me alone, God. Wrong. That's a lie. Oops. You see, the gospel is trying to tell you that there is only one, uh, there's only one line here. Okay? On the bottom is a place without God. On the top, with God. And we all start where? Start here. See, this is the picture I want you to see. The picture I'm talking about is that we, a place without God, called hell, we, we have no God. And what God did, what the cool thing is, Jesus came down and rescued us from a place without God because he wants to be reunited with his creation, who we love, and he brings us back up with God. So that might be better than saying heaven or hell, but it's the same thing. Hell is, the, wor the worst thing about hell is not burning. It's the worst thing about hell is being without your father, your maker. And so it is a place without God. And he created a place. If you don't want it, fine. I don't have to be there. And this is where we all started. And so salvation is Jesus coming down, plucking us up out of place, and bringing us up so that we can be with him. And hopefully that gives you a better picture. So this picture up here, wrong. There is no neutrality. The Bible says either you're for me or you're against me. And so if People say, well, why did God send me to hell? No, 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 no. We started there. And God came down and rescued and picked us up. Make sense? Because that's going to be very important because we're not work-based salvation. And so uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to give you some categories and definitions as we kind of take this uh, next few minutes together. And then uh, I'm going to end this lecture one. Uh, there are four types of belief systems or filters that I want you to be aware of. Exclusivism. Uh, these are also the nicknames, particularism or restrictivism, is, is what I'm going to hold to. And that is the belief that conscious faith in Christ alone is necessary for salvation. So this basically means you must acknowledge that just Jesus Christ, not like some God in the skies, there's some maker, some star out there that, that, that uh, I believe there's a God is not good enough. It has to be in Christ alone, in his incarnation, in his crucifixion, in his resurrection, and his ascension for and I respond to that. That's particular. Now we say, well, wait, 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 why so bigoted? No, no, that's, that's okay because how do you make a cookie? I can't just start putting everything together. I, there are major ingredients, so you have to hold to those major ingredients and you get a cookie, right? Inclusivism is a belief that Jesus is the only way to God, but that conscious faith in him is not necessary for salvation. So this is kind of the that weird story where, you know, what if he didn't know the gospel? There was that guy out in Africa, 
and uh, he never heard the gospel in the village, and uh, he kind of lives a good life, but he can't say Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus because no one told him. Uh, yes, everybody else who knows Jesus, that's Jesus, but inclusivism saying is that, hey, you know what? He just needs to have conscience faith. He doesn't, he doesn't have to say the name Jesus. And, uh, but I would say that that's, that's one view, all right? And there's pluralism. Pluralism is getting further down liberal, and that's the belief that all religions lead to the same God and that there are many ways to know God. By the way, if there's any questions, this is where you would pause and type me a Facebook or, or send me an email, so feel free to do that at any point in time. Pluralism, pluralism, by the way, these are all quiz questions, is the belief that all religions lead to the same God and that there are many ways to know God. This is the, the picture that you say all roads lead to heaven. Okay, you get that? The, the, all roads lead to heaven. In fact, uh, you can hear the story like, hey, you know what? You're climbing up on one side of the mountain, and I'm climbing up on the other side of the mountain. And guess what? Uh, however you climb up the mountain, you're going to get to the top, and that top is God. Hinduism climbs up this way. Muslims climb up this way. Christians climb up this way, and the top is God. Well, here's the problem with that. God never asked us to climb up a mountain. See, every faith that we're going to study together requires us to do requires us to do some kind of work, and we have to kind of march our way up to heaven. And if you remember, I just showed you a picture. You didn't have to work your way up. In fact, God, Jesus, came down to you. He came down to us, to me. He walked down the mountain. He left his throne of grace. To rescue me. I don't have to walk up the mountain. He's going to carry me up that mountain. This is a fundamental truth that the Bible teaches that no other faith holds to. So pluralism says all roads lead to heaven. Uh, Allah is another name for God, and we'll learn that that's not true. What I'm trying to say is no, the God we serve did not ask you to climb the mountain. Christians believe that Jesus came down that mountain. Incarnation rescue us. That is the beautiful picture of the gospel. Universalism, this is a little off, believe that in, in the end everyone will be saved. It basically means, you know what, love wins, everybody's going, don't worry man, God's going just, you don't have to do anything. You just live your life you want to live, God's going to find a grace in you. I don't know if I can hold that, because that's a, uh, you're walking a fine line there. It's like live the way you want to live, no matter what, I, I love you. It's kind of like talking to a, a uh, ladies, this is, I guess, the analogy I would say is like, it's like a guy saying, you know what, live your life how you want to live. Go sleep as many as women you want. Don't worry, don't be faithful to me. I'll take you back anyways. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. God wants your faithfulness, your loyalty. And I'm not sure if universalism holds up uh, to the Bible. So these are four areas, definitely quiz questions. Uh, I definitely want to study that and uh, as well. So let me give you an idea about what we believe. Conscious faith in Jesus Christ is necessary for salvation. Three major bullet points. It talks about it. Um, here's the slide. Jesus Christ is the apex of divine revelation, the authoritative standard by which all religions, beliefs, and truths claims are judged. Jesus Christ, ultimate, he is God. The death and resurrection of Christ are the only atoning acts by which sin and guilt are conquered. That's it. You need the resurrection. We believe and respond to it. We literally believe that he physically died and he physically rose again. Three, the death and resurrection of Christ are or at the, the very center of the Christian faith and redemptive history. He died for a reason. The Bible major theme points to the cross. And we have to hold to that. That's what we will fight and die for. That's how we know things are not counterfeit. Number four, Scripture teaches that salvation comes only through repentance and faith in Christ, atoning work on the cross and resurrection. Apart from conscience, faith in Christ, one cannot be saved. Christ claimed to be the only way of, Jesus, of salvation. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so that's kind of where we stand on that. And so this class, we hold to that. Uh, I have a couple more slides, but I wanted to um, just kind of take our time and end here because uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the Christian faith in our next class. But here's some biblical responses to pluralism. Because pluralism is actually where everybody, a lot of 21st century people, young adults, hold to right now. Well, pluralism, all roads lead to heaven, and I just share with you, cannot be true. 
the lie is that we're neutral and we walk a certain way. Well, someone's got to be right and someone's got to be wrong. Now, when you say, hey, why are you condemning other people? I'm not. What I'm trying to say, there's truth out there. So let's talk about comparative religions. My last analogy is we shut off. The world that we live in tends to tell us is that if these group of people over here believe a certain thing, leave them alone, that's their truth. We call that postmodernism. Or these people over here, they believe in certain things, and uh, that's truth, and so leave them alone. That's what they want to believe. I don't need to convince anybody. I believe the Bible is truth. And let me just give you a perfect picture of what I want to say. Is like, I want you to do this exercise with me. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes for a second. I'm going to close my eyes too. Close my eyes. I'm closing my eyes right now. And I'm going to tell you that I see darkness. I don't see anything. And I'm going to tell you that outside right now, it's in the evening, and I don't see the sun. And what I want to say is everybody online watching this, I want to tell you that there is no sun. The sun doesn't exist. I don't see it. I don't feel it. I can't. It does not exist. So when people tell me, no, the sun is real, the sun is real, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. Do you see it? Your eyes are closed. Do you see it? I want you to open your eyes. That is what postmodernism thinking, post thinking is. It is when a group of people agree to certain values or truths and say, we don't see the sun, so therefore the sun is not real. That's what happens. But you know the truth. You don't have to convince them. So what happens if a person says the sun's not real? I don't see him. A blind person. And you say, no, the sun's real. I see it. Well, you don't need to convince them. What you're going to think is that that person's crazy. Or if you went blind and you've already seen the sun, you know the sun exists. I guess I'm just going to ask you this. Open your eyes. The truth is there. The truth will set you free is what the Bible says. And so even though there are different sets of opinions and truths, that supposed truths out there, the truth is the sun is real. It's your choice if you want to open your eyes or not. Make sense, class? Hey, I want to say thank you for this time as we've closed our first lecture. Um, I appreciate it together. And so go ahead and begin your assignments. I'll see you next time for lecture two, which is next week. And we're going to begin the faith of evangelicals. And I'll spend my time talking about the, the Christian faith of what we know. And I'll do some house cleaning as well. So I bid you a good week. I bid you an awesome time as you study and read and, and be diligent in your studies. Welcome back to school. Take care, guys. Bye.